You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you, as always, from the sunny climes of Western Japan here on the 6th day of December 2019. You're tuned into episode 368 of The Corbett Report podcast, The Duma Hoax. Anatomy of a False Flag. And as you might surmise from that title, today we are going to be undertaking a thoroughgoing exploration of the chemical weapons attack which was alleged to have occurred in Douma on the outskirts of Damascus in Syria on the 7th of April 2018. And the purpose of today's exploration is twofold. Firstly, it is to bring you up to speed on the remarkable developments that have been taking place in this case over the past few weeks alone let alone all the amazing twists and turns that this story has taken in the past year and a half. But secondly, although not secondarily, it is to expose how a false flag operation is conceived and conducted and then perpetrated and perpetuated by various groups, the media, the government, the military, all of the organizations that stand to benefit from this type of attack. Because, as I have pointed out on this podcast many times in the past, false flag terrorism is essentially a magic trick. And if we can simply expose that magic trick to the audience, then the magician will not be able to pull it out of his hat the next time he wants to. And that is an exceptionally important thing, because as we know, there are centuries of documented examples of false flag terror incidents being used to whip populations into war fever and war fervor. And if we are only limiting ourselves to lies, false flag lies that are being told about chemical weapons, we can still see how in very recent history such lies have led the world to disastrous wars in the past. The gravity of this moment is matched by the gravity of the threat that Iraq's weapons of mass destruction pose to the world. Let me now turn to those deadly weapons programs and describe why they are real and present dangers to the region and to the world. Less than a teaspoon of dry anthrax, a little bit about this amount. This is just about the amount of a teaspoon. Less than a teaspoonful of dry anthrax in an envelope shut down the United States Senate in the fall of 2001. This forced several hundred people to undergo emergency medical treatment and killed two postal workers just from an amount, just about this quantity that was inside of an envelope. Iraq declared 8,500 liters of anthrax, but UNSCOM estimates that Saddam Hussein could have produced 25,000 liters If concentrated into this dry form, this amount would be enough to fill tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of teaspoons. And Saddam Hussein has not verifiably accounted for even one teaspoonful of this deadly material. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. Despite the best efforts of the mockingbird repeaters in the mainstream media to shove such inconvenient incidents down the collective memory hole whenever it comes time for a new humanitarian love bombing in some other part of the world, be it Libya or Syria or anywhere else, I think it does not need a great deal of elaboration for the general public to understand just what is at stake when it comes to these lies about chemical weapons in particular, or lies about false flag terrorism in general. And in case you don't recall, the idea of striking Syria in the wake of this alleged attack that was alleged to have taken place in Douma really did bring the world to the brink 
of all-out warfare between U.S. and Russia, a.k.a. the two nuclear superpowers of the world. An incredibly dangerous situation, and all brought about on the back of a series of demonstrable lies. As I say, some remarkable developments have been taking place in recent weeks to completely eviscerate the lies that have been sold to the public since this incident took place, or was alleged to have taken place, <clears throat> which uh, are remarkable. So I will start today's episode with a caveat that this is, of course, a story that is unfolding as I am recording this, as you are watching it. It is continuing to unfold. Some remarkable revelations have taken place recently with leaked documents and emails and whistleblowers stepping forward, but the people involved in this are saying that there is more yet to come, at least at the time that I'm recording this. So uh, there is a good chance that this story will have already moved on by the time you were hearing these words, or it will be in the process of moving on. So this is not meant to be the final word on the matter, but it does hopefully bring you up to speed on this story so that we can take these documented lies and shove them in the face of the propagandists who attempt to shove these false flag incidents down the throat of the population to justify the war hysteria. At the very least, hopefully we can take these documented lies and expose them to others uh, around us who may be more, shall we say, credulous of these lies and the liars who tell them. So let's start with a timeline of events, just so that we're all on the same page and we all have the same uh, understanding of what was at least the official story of what was alleged to have taken place. And all of this happens in the context of April 2018, when after years of battle with Jaish al-Islam, which was an admittedly Saudi-backed terrorist insurgency operating to overthrow the government of Syria, uh, that was highly prevalent in eastern Ghouta and specifically in the outskirts of Damascus, and the Syrian government in April 2018 were on the verge of victory against Jaish al-Islam in eastern Ghouta. And it was at that time, on April 7th, 2018, that Syrian army forces were engaged in combat with those terrorist insurgents in Douma, which is a suburb to the northeast of Damascus. And immediately, videos alleging to document the aftermath of a chemical weapons attack began flooding social media. On April 8th, so less than 24 hours before these reports started to trickle out, Trump took to Twitter to denounce animal Assad for this atrocity and promised that there will be a big price for Putin, Russia, and Iran to pay for supporting Assad. On April 13th, the White House issued a press release claiming that the attack was carried out by Syrian forces and that the information points to the use of the nerve agent sarin. And on April 14th, after a flurry of diplomatic activity, the US, French, and Britain launched a coordinated strike on Syrian targets. My fellow Americans, a short time ago, I ordered the United States Armed Forces to launch precision strikes on targets associated with the chemical weapons capabilities of Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. The powerful missile attack on three targeted sites involved 105 weapons, 66 Raytheon Tomahawks, that's the U.S. military's go-to, launched from three warships and a Virginia-class submarine. That same day, April 14th, 2018, investigators on the fact-finding mission from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the OPCW, arrived in Syria to begin their investigation into the incident which the U.S., Britain, and France had just struck Syria for. And on April 17th, Robert Fisk reports from Douma on a local doctor who believes that the victims died of suffocation, not a chemical weapons attack. I've just been in the town of Duma. I found the clinic where the film of the children are dropping at the mouth and having water thrown at them was made. 
But the senior hospital doctor, who actually spoke very good English, um, who was there, told me that the video is, is real, that they were not suffering from gas poisoning, but suffering from panic and hypoxia, as he put it, because of the amount of dust in the tunnels in which they live. All through years, people in the Duma area have been living beneath their own homes in tunnels and basements. And that night, there was a lot of sharing by the Syrian army and by the Russian Air Force. Um, and it produced a huge amount of dust and like, debris in the streets. And many people were finding it difficult to breathe. And when they reached the clinic, according to the doctor, um, someone shouted gas and they panicked. Um, but he did confirm that the film, the videotape, was indeed taken in the clinic there, the same clinic that I actually interviewed him in. On April 21st, investigators from that fact-finding mission of the OPCW begin collecting evidence and kicking off the nearly year-long process of producing a report on the incident. And it wasn't until July 6th, that summer, that the OPCW released their interim report on the incident, confirming that, quote, no organophosphorus nerve agent or their degradation products were detected in the environmental samples or in the plasma samples taken from alleged casualties. The report did imply that a chlorine weapon attack took place. It says, quote, Along with explosive residues, various chlorinated organic chemicals were found in samples from two sites, for which there is full chain of custody. But the report made no mention of the concentrations or levels of chlorinated agents that were found. Annex 2 of the report, titled Open Sources, is blank, stating simply, they are to be provided in the final report. And Annex 3, listing analysis results, lists every sample collected and notes that no Chemical Weapons Convention scheduled chemicals were detected in any of them. So fast forward to February of 2019, where a BBC producer tweets that he could prove without a doubt that the Duma Hospital video alleging to show victims of the chemical attack receiving treatment for their chemical attack injuries, was staged. Well-known BBC Syria producer has dropped a bombshell with claims that footage of the alleged April 2018 Duma chemical attack captured by the opposition groups known as the White Helmets was fabricated. Riam Delati tweeted on Wednesday that after six months of the investigation, he can prove without a doubt that the Duma hospital scene was staged. He also said there were no fatalities at the hospital and no sarin was used. But he noted it's not clear at the moment whether chlorine was used. The BBC has yet to respond officially to the claims. The following month, March 2019, marks the release of the OPCW fact-finding mission's final report into the incident, which confirmed that no nerve agents were found at the scene and that it was impossible to determine what caused the symptoms observed in the potentially staged videos, but concluded that there were, quote, reasonable grounds to believe that, quote, the use of toxic chemical as a weapon took place. And it does say that that toxic chemical lightly, likely involved some sort of chlorinated agent. Now, fast forward to May 2019, when a leaked engineering assessment by an OPCW engineering sub-team emerges. The document was prepared in February of 2019, shortly before the release of the final report, and undermines the official narrative that two cylinders that were found at the scene were, in fact, chemical weapons delivery devices that had been dropped into, onto the, the building by Syrian government helicopters. The leaked assessment, again leaked in May of 2019, but prepared before the release of the final report, concluded that, quote, there is a high probability that both cylinders were manually placed at those two locations rather than being delivered from an aircraft. Yes, well, back in March, the... OPCW's official fact-finding mission uh, published its report, which, as you said earlier, was the one that suggested the uh, chemical, the cylinders had been dropped from the sky, and that implied the regime was responsible. Now, what we had last week was a document written by a man called Ian Henderson, who, as far as I understand it, uh, 
was working for the OPCW. He had some uh, involvement with the fact-finding mission, but according to the OPCW, he wasn't actually a member of it. Now, it appears that uh, at some point, uh, probably late last year, he was allowed by the OPCW to do some work to basically to carry out his own assessment of what he thought might have happened. Uh, and he had some assistance, it's, again, it's not very clear how much, from a group called the Engineering Subteam. So uh, this document was then uh, leaked last week. Uh, it was written, uh, what we have that was leaked was a final, it's marked final draft. And it's dated February the 27th, which interestingly was just two days before the official report was published. Uh, we don't know exactly uh, what status this document has. Uh, one thing that some people say is that once the uh, data had all been gathered from the Duma investigation, there were internal discussions and assessments within the OPCW to uh, draw a sort of uh, collective view of what had happened. And it may be that Mr Henderson's document was part of that, although he was taking a very different view of the situation from the one that appeared in the report eventually. On May 28th of this year, OPCW Director General Fernando Arias addressed the OPCW member states in an internal communique. He points out that the document, quote, pointed at possible attribution, which is outside of the mandate of the FFM, the fact-finding mission, with regard to the formulation of its findings. He expresses concern about the leak, not the information contained in the leak, but the fact that the report was leaked, and he authorizes an investigation into how the leak took place, while reaffirming the final report's conclusions. Now, on October 15th of this year, the Courage Foundation convenes a panel of, quote, concerned individuals from the fields of disarmament, international law, journalism, military operations, medicine, and intelligence in Brussels to hear from a whistleblower of the OPCW fact-finding mission team. The whistleblower, delivering a, quote, extensive presentation including internal emails, text exchanges, and suppressed draft reports, describes, quote, efforts to exclude some inspectors from the investigation whilst thwarting their attempts to raise legitimate concerns, highlight irregular practices, or even to express their differing observations and assessments. The panel, quote, became convinced by the testimony that key information about chemical analyses, toxicology consultations, ballistic studies, and witness testimonies was suppressed, ostensibly to favor a preordained conclusion, and the panel expressed unanimous alarm about, quote, unacceptable practices in the OPCW investigation. On November 15th, Jonathan Steele wrote about a new OPC whistleblower who he calls Alex. Alex is a, was a member of that OPCW fact-finding mission and alleged that his conclusion that the signs and symptoms of victims of the attack were not consistent with poisoning from chlorine and that it could be concluded that whatever happened in Duma was a, quote, non-chemical related event was stripped from the report at the last minute. He also discovered that the actual levels of chlorinated organic compounds found at the scene had been much lower than what would be expected in the wake of a chemical attack a fact that was also left out of the report. Steele's article rec recounts multiple interventions on behalf of OPCW management to try to placate the incensed scientists of the FFM who felt that their investigation was being undermined. Quote, On July 4th, there was another intervention. Fairweather, the chef de cabinet, invited several members of the drafting team to his office. There they found three U.S. officials who were cursorily introduced without making clear which U.S. agencies they represented. The Americans told them emphatically that the Syrian regime had conducted a gas attack, and that the two cylinders found on the roof and upper floor of the building contained 170 kilograms of chlorine. The inspectors left Fairweather's office feeling that the invitation to the Americans to address them was unacceptable pressure and a violation of the OPCW's declared principles of independence and impartiality." End quote. Steele told BBC News that he believed that the entire incident had been a fake propaganda event staged by the Jaish al-Islam terrorists to bring American intervention into the region 
against their Syrian enemies. He claims he was in charge of picking up the samples in the affected areas and in neutral areas to check whether there were chlorine derivatives there. And? And he found that there was no difference. So it rather suggested there was no chemical gas attack because in the buildings where the people allegedly died, there was no extra chlorine organic, chlorinated organic chemicals than in the normal streets elsewhere. I mean, I put this to the OPCW for comment and they haven't yet replied, but it, it rather suggests that a lot of this was propaganda. Propaganda led by? Led by the rebel side to try and bring in American planes, which in fact did happen. Then on November 23rd of this year, just two weeks ago, one of the emails from that source was released. And that email accuses OPCW management of doctoring the Syria report. The email was sent to OPC management in June of 2008, shortly before the release of the interim report, and calls that report's conclusion that chlorine or another reactive chlorine-containing chemical was likely released from cylinders highly misleading, that the chemical traces discovered could be found in household bleach, and that singling out chlorine gas as one of the possibilities is disingenuous. The email goes on to critique a number of other changes made to draft versions of the report, including removal of analysis regarding the inconsistency in victim symptoms in the potentially staged videos, and removal of extensive analysis of the placement of the cylinders. And having personally seen this email, as well as other documents from one OPCW source, Peter Hitchens writes on his blog that, quote, A source has told me that the OPCW report, which was eventually published on July 7, 2018, was stripped of a vital fact at the last minute. The traces of chlorinated material which were found at the site were so small and so easily available that they could simply not be said to show that chlorine gas was employed. The Mail on Sunday has also been told that, in the days before the original document was due to be published, a second report, shorn of many of its most important findings, was prepared behind the backs of most of the OPCW scientists. A source inside the OPCW says that this move was discovered at the last minute. It was then met with protests from scientists, including the email sent to two senior OPCW officials, which the Mail on Sunday has seen. The source says a compromise was offered in which the truth about the tiny traces of chlorine would be told though the report would still be heavily redacted. The scientists accepted this, but even this promise was then broken, and a third version of this document was issued, which left out the vital fact. The wording of this report was so vague that news organizations around the world concluded, incorrectly, that it said that chlorine gas had been used or might have been used. If the key material had been left in, they could not have done this. Since then, Dissenting scientists have sought for months to find a way of setting the record straight inside the OPCW, but all their efforts have failed, leading to the leak of the email. Shortly following this, the Professor of Science, Technology, and National Security Policy at MIT, Theodore Postel, a vocal and outspoken critic of many of the lies surrounding the Syria chemical weapons allegations, not only in Duma, but in Khan Shikun before that, joined Aaron Mate on the Pushback podcast to discuss the revelations. Well, this is why we're talking to you now. And, you know, you raise concerns about this report. And you also raise concerns based on what the first whistleblower said, which is that the, the physics here just did not add up. But now you have a second whistleblower who was on the ground, who collected chemical samples at the scene in Duma and said basically that there was no difference between chemical samples collected outside the alleged attack scene and uh, chemical samples collected inside the alleged attack scene. Uh, more evidence than uh, to those who saw, who reviewed the whistleblower's evidence, according to the panel that was convened, that this whole thing was staged. But what is your assessment of what you've heard so far from the second whistleblower? Well, I think um, uh, it's clear from the findings of the second whistleblower that the staging effort uh, did not include the planting of false chemical evidence. Uh, that's, that is to say, I'm not suggesting... What the, what, what the whistleblower established is that there's, there isn't even false uh, chemical evidence. In the case of Khan Sheikun, which happened a year earlier, uh, there was an attempt to uh, uh, create a, a, false, a, a false trail of, um, of samples where they had, uh, for example, they poisoned the goat 
uh, with Saren, the local people who, who staged that scene, and then they provided the UN, um, uh, uh, the OPCW, with uh, samples that had been tampered with. So the, U, so the OPCW in that case found sarin on the samples, but of course, it had the samples been subjected to a proper chain of custody, they would have never found any samples because the, uh, the people on the scene uh, produced the sarin and then uh, used it to further uh, mislead the OPCW. Although, in that case, the OPCW also should have known there was a problem because on, in that case, the goat that was supposedly dead at the scene had drag marks behind it. So the carcass was obviously dumped from a truck and then dragged over to the location where it was shown on videos. In this case, we have a, um, a whistleblower who was on the ground, who's a real expert, and the whistleblower looked for evidence and couldn't find any evidence uh, of, uh, of chemical release. So that's further evidence of how sloppily uh, the scene was uh, staged. And it also is, further, is a further indictment of the OPCW for uh, not um, producing an accurate report, since they clearly, I mean, there's no excuse at any level. This uh, expert went to the person in charge of the OPCW integrity an analysis and reported this, and he, and he was basically shut down. And uh, there's this other report that was obviously released, the earlier whistleblower report, which was obviously done by a real group of first-class professional experts. And that was uh, dismissed by this ambassador who um, is the head of the OPCW at the, at the moment. And there's no way he's doing his job if, if if he didn't look at this uh, report. So uh, to, to, to suggest that this report that was originally released was somehow a difference of opinion uh, is, is totally ridiculous from a technical analytical point of view. I mean, when you look at the report that, the, uh, that was released and that the, uh, this ambassador from the OPCW is defending, None of the technical findings, none of the technical analysis in the report matches what the report claims. It's just ridiculous. And so compounding this is you have now apparently the second whistleblower, who we have not heard directly from yet, uh, but reportedly, according to WikiLeaks and the Courage Foundation, which convened this panel where the second whistleblower testified, according to them, the second whistleblower wants to now testify publicly and said that he tried to bring his concerns to the top levels of the, of the OPCW, but that he was silenced. And you mentioned chain of custody, and I think it's important to stress why that's so important, is because the samples and evidence that the OPC received from Khan Sheikhoun uh, came from an area that was controlled by militants, militants fighting the Assad government in Syria, and in both cases, Khan Sheikhoun in 2017 and Duma in 2018, a year later basically, both those instances, both those claims of an Assad uh, government chemical weapons attack led to U.S. airstrikes, which is all the more reason why it's important to subject this to scrutiny. Let me read to you, Ted, um, a quote from one of the members of the WikiLeaks panel that it convened to hear from the second whistleblower. Uh, his name is Jose Bustani, and he is the first director general of the OPCW. Uh, well, let, me, let me interrupt for a second. Uh, Bustani uh, was considered for a Nobel Prize because of the great job he did putting together the OPCW. Mm. So he has a big interest in, in making sure this organization functions. Well, let me read you the quote. He says, The convincing evidence of regular behavior in the OPCW investigation of the alleged Duma chemical attack confirms doubts and suspicions I already had. I could make no sense of what I was reading in the international press. Even official reports of investigations seemed incoherent at best. The picture is certainly clearer now, although very disturbing. Well, I, I, I agree completely uh, with his assessment. In fact, I've already written him. I haven't heard yet back from him. And I sent him copies of uh, my assessment as well. And so um, uh, I think he and this panel, which I've also uh, communicated with, uh, 
have those copies now, and uh, I, I know they're looking at it. I, I've already had some, you know, some preliminary uh, exchanges with them. So how have the propagandists and promoters of the official narrative responded to these remarkable revelations? Well, the OPCW, for its part, responded rather predictably. According to CBS News, chemical weapons watchdog OPCW defends Syria report as whistleblower claims bias, where you can find that the OPCW simply dismisses this internal kerfuffle as nothing of any significance. Don't look over here. Meanwhile, the establishment propagandists have responded in interesting style. November 25th, Elliot Higgins of Bellingcat published a seven-point refutation of the concerns raised by the whistleblower's email. And the points that he goes through, which I will, of course, link in the show notes so that you can go and read through his refutation yourself, claim that the major issues raised in the email were in fact addressed by the interim report that was released after that email was written, and concludes that, based on this analysis, it is clear that WikiLeaks, the Daily Mail, La Republica, and Stunden have failed to understand the context of this letter and the final Duma report. Well, two days later, Caitlin Johnstone responded to Elliot Higgins, and, well, we're going to read an extensive quotation from her response because it is A very well-done response. It is under the title, Narrative Manager's Faceplant in Hilarious OPCW Scandal Spin Job, and it reads, in part, quote, Imperialist propaganda firm Bellingcat has published a response to the ever-expanding OPCW scandal, and it's got to be seen to be believed. Before we begin, I should highlight that Bellingcat is funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, which, according to its own co-founder, was set up to do overtly what the CIA had previously been doing covertly, namely orchestrating narrative management geared toward the elimination of governments which refuse to comply with U.S. interests. NED is funded directly by the U.S. government, which means that Bellingcat is funded by the U.S. government via an organization set up to promote imperialist regime change agendas. Bellingcat is also funded by Open Society Foundations, another imperialist narrative management operation. Syria has been the target of what may be the most sophisticated propaganda campaign in history, and Bellingcat has been consistently rallying behind even the most transparently ridiculous tools of this campaign. This includes the notorious Banna Alabed PSYOP, which at its height saw CNN staging a fake scripted interview featuring a seven-year-old girl assigning blame to Bashar al-Assad from an alleged sarin gas attack in Khan Shikun. Bellingcat's stellar investigative work, which has been praised in fawning puff pieces by mainstream outlets like The Guardian and The New Yorker, concluded that this obvious propaganda construct was in fact nothing other than a little girl and her mother independently composing viral tweets, giving interviews, and authoring books about how the Syrian government must be toppled via Western interventionism. Bellingcat's latest phenomenal report on how you're supposed to think about important geopolitical disputes, titled Emails and Reading Comprehension, OPCW Duma Coverage Misses Critical Facts, addresses the leaked OPCW email, which was recently published by WikiLeaks and various other outlets, revealing that the OPCW omitted critical information from its Duma report, which indicated that a chemical weapons attack was unlikely to have occurred. I encourage you to go and check out Bellingcat's new masterpiece for yourself. Don't worry about giving them clicks. That's not where they get their money. The first thing you'll notice about Bellingcat's article is that at no point does it even attempt to address the actual inflammatory comments within it, such as the OPCW whistleblower's assertion that the samples tested where where a chlorine gas attack is alleged to have occurred in April 2018 contained levels of chlorinated organic compounds which were so low that it would be unreasonable to claim with any confidence that a chlorine gas attack had occurred at all. The whistleblower writes in the leaked email to the OPCW cabinet chief that the levels were, in most cases, present only in parts per billion range, as low as 1 to 2 ppb, which is essentially trace quantities. As we discussed previously, early skeptics of the establishment Duma narrative highlighted the bizarre fact that when the OPCW published its interim report in July of last year, its report contained no information about the levels at which the chlorinated organic chemicals occurred. Chlorinated organic chemicals occur at trace levels in any industrialized area, so they are only indicative of a chlorine gas attack when samples test at high levels. The email said they didn't. 
the OPCW omitted this in both its interim and final reports. The whistleblower told journalist Jonathan Steele that the levels found were comparable to and even lower than those given in the World Health Organization's guidelines on recommended permitted levels of trichlorophenol and other COCs in drinking water. Had they been included, the public would have seen that the levels of COCs found were no higher than you would expect in any household environment, the whistleblower said. In a new Fox News interview with Tucker Carlson, Steele explained the significance of this revelation. The main point is that chlorine gas degrades rapidly in the air, so that coming in two weeks later, you wouldn't find anything. But what you would find is that the gas can contaminate or affect other chemicals in the natural environment, yes. so-called chlorinated organic chemicals. But the, the difficulty is that they exist anyway in the natural environment anyway, and in water and so on. And so the crucial thing is the levels. Were there more so, higher levels of chlorinated organic chemicals found after the alleged gas attack than there would have been in the normal environment? Bellingcat simply ignores this absolutely central aspect of this email, as well as the whistleblower's point about the symptoms of victims not matching chlorine gas poisoning. In this case, the confidence in the identity of chlorine or any choking agent is drawn into question precisely because of the inconsistency with the report and observed symptoms, the whistleblower writes in the email. The inconsistency was not only noted by the FFM team, but strongly noted by three toxicologists with expertise in exposure to CW, chemical weapons agents. Bellingcat says nothing about these revelations in the email, and says nothing about the fact that the OBCW excluded them from both its interim report in July 2018 and its final report in March 2019, the latter of which actually asserted the exact opposite, saying there was reasonable grounds that the use of a toxic chemical as a weapon took place. This toxic chemical contained reactive chlorine. The toxic chemical was likely molecular chlorine. Bellingcat completely ignores all of these points, which are literally the only reason any of this is in the news at all, instead opting to make silly, pedantic arguments that the text of the email in the interim and final reports indicate that some of the whistleblower's concerns appear to have been partially addressed by OPCW leadership in its publications. To make this argument, Bellingcat highlights how some of the wording in the reports was changed to appear a bit less conclusive, such as changing likely to possible, and changing reactive chlorine-containing chemical to chemical-containing reactive chlorine. By highlighting these barely significant changes, Bellingcat attempts to spin the narrative that there was no internal OPCW cover-up of its investigators' findings at all, which is of course invalidated by the fact that its final report concluded that a chlorine gas attack had taken place despite the whistleblower clearly stating that there is no basis upon which to conclude this. It's also obviously invalidated by the fact that not one, but two whistleblowers have come forward, meaning they plainly do not feel as though their concerns were met. Well, she goes on to talk in much greater detail, and I will let you continue reading that article. It goes on with a lot of detail, but I think you get the point. And in case you didn't, uh, Peter Hitchens, who you recall is one of the other journalists who had directly contact, uh, if not with Alex, this whistleblower, OPC whistleblower himself, at least an OPCW source, and had directly seen some of these emails and documents, did write his own response to Bellingcat uh, just the other day in a post titled Bellingcat or Gar Guard Dog for the Establishment, where he wrote, quote, Bellingcat have been so anxious to trash the leak from the OPCW that they have, as many did when the attack was first released, rushed to judgment without waiting for the facts. More is known by the whistleblowers of the OPCW than has yet been released, but verification procedures have slowed down its release. More documents will, I expect, shortly come to light. One, which I have seen, is very interesting. It is a memorandum of protest, written many months after the email of protest published at the weekend. This was sent to the OPCW Director General Fernando Arias, there is some doubt about whether it ever reached him, by an OPCW investigator one of those who actually visited Duma, on the 14th of March 2019. It has reached me through hitherto reliable sources. This is nearly two weeks after the release of the final report on Friday 1st of March 2019, which is supposed to have resolved the doubts of the dissenters. And here's a link to that report, the, uh, the final report. All right, so 
in conclusion, there is no conclusion to this story yet. There, as I say, I am recording this at uh, the beginning of December 2019. It is a story in flux. By the time you are hearing this, the story may have already moved on with new documents, or it may be in the process of moving on. But at this point, it is safe to say that this completely undermines the narrative that we have been fed since the attack took place, since before any fact-finding mission had even been dispatched to Syria, let alone before it had issued a single word on the subject, let alone after its issuing of its final report, that this is a tissue of lies and a demonstrable one. And, and it is coming apart at the seams. And there is a certain amount of schadenfreude sure to be had in seeing the narrative of the propagandists being ripped apart in front of their very eyes and seeing them scramble like chickens with their heads cut off to try to put the pieces back together, even as more revelations are about to come out that will further undermine their pathetic attempts to use pedantry to try to deflect the main issues that are at play here. But I think we should not dwell in that schadenfreude because that ultimately misses the point of what is happening here. This is not about any particular propagandists getting their comeuppance or something along those lines, um, because the propagandists who do serve as toadies to the establishment will find that at the precise time at which their particular flavor of propaganda no longer suits the public's taste and the veneer of open source investigation, internet-y type of... Uh, relatable information. Oh, look at us. We're, we're the, the hip new way to spread pop, uh, imperialist propaganda. Those organizations will be thrown under the bus by the propagandists at their first available opportunity as soon as it becomes apparent that they are no longer really doing any good for the cause of furthering imperial propaganda. So, yes, it is. Uh, there is a certain schadenfreude to be found in seeing those organizations being destroyed in front of our eyes. But, as I say, this does go far beyond that. This goes into the heart of the nature of false flag operations, how and why they are perpetrated, and how they can actually be exposed. And of course, of course, we're never going to have the CNN article to come out and say, oops, oh, it turns out this was all a hoax. And look, this was all part of a false flag operation that was designed to draw the American military response and uh, draw them into, uh, it's basically save the terrorists who were being routed out of Eastern Ghouta at that time. I, I, we're never going to get that out of this, but we are going to get all of these pieces that are being diligently reported on from many different angles in the independent media, and this is the documentable, verifiable, hard fact, actual emails and documents, information that we can be putting in front of the normies in our lives right now to break the tool of false flag terror in the propagandist's face. Because as I say, this is a magic trick. If we show the audience what is up the magician's sleeve, he cannot perform the trick again. And this is not a game. This is not some sort of intellectual exercise. This is life and death. We have seen in very recent living memory how lies about chemical weapons have led to disastrous wars. And of course, they were just the tissue veneer of lies that were used to cover over and provide the fig leaf of justification for those wars. It had nothing to do with the real reason for the wars, but that's precisely the point. And if we do not fall for the same lies again and again and again, the propagandists cannot use these lies again and again and again. And the conflict in Syria very easily could come to outright military confrontation between the United States and Russia, let alone other powers. And that is truly something I think we are all highly motivated to avoid. And so it is important to be exposing this information as it's coming to light. And that's where we're going to have to leave it for today. Uh, uh, there's a lot of information already exposed. There is more shortly to come to light or so, seemingly so. So I will hope that everyone will be on top of this and please do report back to headquarters. Please do leave updates to this information as it ex is exposed in the comment section at CorbettReport.com so that we can continue to keep an eye on it together. I will throw a couple of other resources in here that might be useful, that I've found useful over the past year and a half of analysis of this. One is a very detailed analysis of the photos and videos of the 
alleged attack, the alleged photos and videos, the potentially staged ones, uh, by Stephen McIntyre, um, who did an excellent job of looking at the ways that these scenes seem to have been staged. Uh, I will also throw a work uh, a link into the working group on Syria propaganda and media, which had a very extensive report on all of the uh, twists and turns of this story up to July of this year, so preceding this second whistleblower, but um, including a lot of the other revelations that have come out, called How the OPCW's Investigation of the Duma Incident Was Nobbled, which, again, has a lot of information in it. There are other resources out there, and of course there's going to be a lot of things to go through in the show notes. So I hope that this will get people up to speed on what's happening so that they can continue to follow this story as it goes ahead. Again, I don't think I need to stress how important it is, not even specifically to this particular incident in the Syrian war, although of course that is uh, very important, but more generally uh, to the revelation, the real-time unfolding revelation of a false flag incident. It is coming apart at the seams in front of our very eyes. Let's at least make sure that we have our eyes on the ball and are not distracted by the silly political issue of the day in the 24-7 news cycle. On that note, we're going to leave things there. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. If you appreciate this work, please help to keep this website going and growing. CorbettReport.com slash members. You can sign up for a membership to support this website for as little as $1 a month. I do appreciate all that support. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again very shortly. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.